Thank you for changing your clocks. <laughs> thank you for weathering the storm. And thank you for being a part of our worship service this morning. Uh, my dad and mom would tell the story that one time they forgot to change their clocks. And they were only entering the vestibule as everybody was leaving. So they were greeting everybody like they were there for the whole service. And they walked out and got in their cars and left. So, uh, but I have to think of that every time we have a time change of the story that my parents said. But we're glad to have you this morning. Uh, I'm not sure we're not going to make the visitors stand up. But if you are here for the first time, we do have a wonderful welcome bag in the lobby. So see me or one of the greeters. And also, let's see one's here. This is our Connect card. This is what a Connect card looks like. If you look in your pew, pew, it would be great if you could fill that out and maybe put it in our offering boxes so that we can communicate with you and that we can greet you in, in the way that we would like to. So anyway, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, also, uh, we've been having some good donations for the food bank, but just a little heads up, check the expiration dates. The food bank will not accept anything that's expired. So before you donate anything, check that expiration date and um, then you know, feel free to donate. Uh, Men's Fellowship Breakfast is next Saturday the 19th. And I think that starts at just in seven o'clock and runs to 9.30? Eight. Eight. Eight o'clock, okay. So uh, guys, it's always a lot of good food when you walk down, you smell all that stuff cooking and I get hungry just thinking about it. But anyway, there is a sign-up sheet. I think it's sort of like a golden amber color over there. So please sign up on the bulletin board for the men's breakfast. That way they can figure out how many they're going to be feeding. Also, for the kids on Easter, they're having an Easter egg hunt for ages 1 through 11. And that's right after the church services on Easter Sunday. Uh, but we need candy donated at, for the Easter eggs and food for the fellowship time. So sign up on the bulletin board in the back there. Please see Heather, Keith, or the pastor if you would like to help with that. Um, also, we're gonna be, do uh, if you would like to donate to help victims in the Ukraine from the war, please see the note in the bulletin. I hope everybody got a bulletin, that stuff. Uh, so that's a definite urgency and we're praying for them and uh, we can hardly imagine what they're experiencing right now. Now, next week, is uh, a week that we're gonna be doing evaluation of the staff and of our pastoral staff here. So uh, if uh, we want you to have your thoughts collected, and this is gonna be for the uh, review of our senior pastor, youth pastor, minister of music, assistant minister of music, ministry coordinator, and the treasurer. The staff reviews will be conducted the week of March 21st, and the elders will welcome positive or negative feedback, uh, either verbally or in a written form, but no anonymous input will be considered. If you don't sign your name, that's gonna be trashed. So uh, please sign your name to all that and feel free to share your feedback with any of the elders. Also a very important thing is we are preparing for Easter and we have our choir going on just like we did at Christmas. The rehearsal for choir is this Thursday at seven o'clock. It's not too late to join. We're doing some great music. It's gonna be a wonderful worship service. So if you'd like to be a part of our choir, there's still time to join. So thank you for again being here and we're gonna open with prayer. But you know, the scriptures tell us in Psalm 51, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise those things. So this morning, as we enter into our worship, we're gonna be asking God to look at our hearts, that our hearts are broken, that we have a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, expressing our need and our dependency upon the Father for his love and his mercy and his forgiveness through the blood of Christ. So let's pray together. Father, we're not entering into this time of worship lightly. We realize, Father, that anybody can sing praises to you. Anybody off the street can sing a hymn. But as we enter into this worship service, we ask you to look at our hearts and see that we truly are humbled, Father, that we realize that we need the blood of Christ to wash away our sins. We need a righteousness that we cannot achieve through actions. So, Father, we're needy people. And as we come before you, Father, we are going to be offering up a sacrifice of praise of worship to you. And I pray that that praise and that worship will come from a humble and contrite heart. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for enabling us to be the body of Christ here at the Mount Joy Church of God. And may our worship be pleasing unto you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand up for our first song. You can be seated. Well, again, we're excited that you're here this morning. Thank you for braving the weather. And uh, actually, our service has three parts to it today. <clears throat> this is our first part, and it's about our Mexico missions trip. And then we're going to do a whole segment of communion and then a message this morning. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Mexico Matters and uh, share with you about our missions trip this summer. And uh, so if we'll go to the next slide, I want to introduce you to Rod and Mariah Fry. Uh, they are missionaries in Mexico City. They have planted three churches already in Mexico City. Uh, Rod is from this area. He grew up in this area, went to school in Elizabethtown, and uh, his parents still live in this area. If you go to uh, the... Uh, what is it, Hofstetters? Hostetters. I get it, Hostetters. You'll see his dad in there. I run into his dad all the time in there. He works there. So Rod is from this area, and uh, he made a trip to Mexico, met his wife. They got married. Uh, they have three kids and, uh, who are older in their 20s, and they're ministering back here in this area right now. 
uh, Word of Life Chapel. Rod is doing Sunday school for 10 weeks down there. Then they're going to be going back to Mexico again, coming up here at the end of April, and again, working with the three churches that they've planted down there. Rod has done many mission trips from this area. Um, so several of the churches, Word of Life Chapel, uh, Hope Fellowship, Mount Calvary, uh, has gone on missions trip there. So a lot of people from this area have already been to Mexico City. That's sort of why I connected with Rod. I had been there on a missions trip with Mount Calvary. And he does a great job with missions trips. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is a picture of the, their newest church that they had just started and built. And uh, they're still doing some construction there. Go on to the next slide. Um, they built a community center also where people come in and they do all kinds of things in the community center. And uh, that's where we'll be spending some of our time is in the community center doing events. And let me just say, this missions trip is for high school and adults. And uh, somebody said to me, oh, it's just for uh, high schoolers. No, this is for everyone. And uh, we want as many people to go as possibly can. So <clears throat> here are several things that we can do while we're there. And let me say, these are all opportunities. What Rod does is once we have a team that says, okay, this is our team who is going, he looks at the abilities of that team, and then he builds the trip around the gifts of the people who are coming. But several things that we will do, uh, we will do two different outreach events. We will do a hearing aid event and dress a girl event. So uh, those who go on the trip with us will take hearing aids in our suitcase. And one day we'll have an event where uh, he'll invite people who have hearing problems to come and there'll be food and uh, there'll be a presentation of the hearing aids and the gospel will be given. Uh, another day, we'll do Dress a Girl, and uh, we'll be connecting with a ministry that's out of Elizabethtown who gets dresses for little girls, and they take them, and they shrink wrap them about that big. And so everybody who goes with us will take about 10 to 20 of those dresses in your suitcase, and, and, and one day, again, we'll do an evangelistic event where we invite moms and their girls to come and uh, we'll give those dresses to the girls. And uh, again, there'll be food. There'll be an evangelistic uh, presentation also. So those two, we will be doing those two events. But then besides that, we'll be doing some light construction. We'll be helping to, to build a platform. Uh, we'll be doing some painting. Uh, he, he has a, a, one of the rooms he'd like to have a mural painted in. Um, we could also do things like English classes, art classes, uh, baking classes. When we went with Mount Calvary, uh, we had a bunch of ladies who went and they taught the ladies there in Mexico how to make apple pies. Uh, they didn't know how to do that. We taught them how to make apple pies that week. Um, we can, if we have people who go who have the ability to sew, we can have a class where we teach women how to repair clothes. So if you have the ability of sewing, we could use you. If you, have, if you teach or if you play a musical instrument or you sing, uh, we can do music classes during that week. So there are all kinds of things that we can do during that week. And again, there's the possibility of a soccer tournament or a basketball tournament. Um, so again, it'll depend on the, uh, the gifts and abilities of those who are going to go with us. The cost of the trip is $1,000, and that's really reasonable for a missions trip. I don't think, other than Mexico City, all the mission trips that I've been on have cost a lot more. But that includes your airfare, your transportation, your lodging, your food, your trip insurance. The extra things that would cost you are your passport and then any spending money that you want to, want to buy souvenirs while you were there. Um, so again... No vaccinations are needed to go to Mexico City. Leaving Mexico, you have to have a positive COVID test to leave. Okay, so negative. negative. 
Not pasta. Thank you. Not pasta. Yeah. Thank you very much for correcting me there. So yeah, you have to have a negative to leave. Um, so again, the trip will be designed for us, and we want to really encourage uh, teens. I already know, I was talking to a teen this week who was planning to go. I know there's at least, uh, Eddie has signed up to go, so, but we'd like you to really think about it. It's a great experience. Um, I think one of the neat things, too, is something different about this missions trip is you actually stay in the homes of the church family. So like if a husband and wife went, you would stay in a home. Or if two ladies went, they would stay in a home together. Or if two men went, they would stay in a home. And you actually get to experience the culture that way. So in the evenings, you go back to your home. Um, and even if you don't speak Spanish, that's fine. You'll learn to communicate somehow with that family that you're staying. And a lot of them speak English anyway. But you'll get to experience that. Uh, so think about it. This will be the first of many missions trips that we begin to promote. Because I really believe getting people out in the mission field, it will change your life. It will change how you see the world. And uh, so, if you're even thinking about it, on April the 1st, which is a Friday night, uh, we're not asking you for a commitment that night, we're just going to have that night to give more, informa more information, Rod and his wife will be here, and she'll be cooking a Mexican dinner. And uh, so you can come and eat Mexican food that night, you can learn more about the trip, you can meet the missionaries uh, that will be hosting us there. And uh, so come and be part of that evening. There's a sign-up sheet for that Mexican dinner. Uh, also in the lobby is our brochure that tells you about the trip. Um, so we want you to really pray about if God would have you to go on this trip. Um, you say, Pastor, you know, I'm, I'm 65. That's okay, you can go. I'm 70, you can go. So I remember we went to um, Columbia, South America on a missions trip. And uh, my father, my father-in-law and another man who were in their late 60s went with us on that missions trip. And that trip was just construction. And those guys did some light construction that week. But this is more than construction. This is a lot of opportunities to serve. Uh, so I think I missed a slide there. Did you have the slide? back up there. So one of the things that Rod likes to do uh, is to expose us to the culture. So we will eat out at a couple places, like there's places where you can get the best street tacos you've ever had. And uh, we'll eat out, but we'll also get to visit. We'll choose. He'll give us a, a half a day each time. Uh, we either, we'll go to one of the volcanoes, and you see that uh, top picture? That volcano there in the back, when I was there, we went up to the top of that. And uh, that's one of the possibilities. One is to the, some of the pyramids outside of Mexico City. And then one day, definitely, we will go into Mexico City. Uh, that's one of the oldest Catholic churches in the world there. And we will visit that site. And you'll learn a lot about how Catholicism is different in Mexico than it is here in America. So... I want, to, I want you to consider it and think about going. Sign up and come to the uh, dinner and learn more about it. This is the area. Of course, Mexico City is huge. Looking out this uh, window of this torn down building is actually the area where Rod has one of his churches planted. And it's in that valley where we'll spend our week uh, there. So think about it. Pray about it and uh, see if God would have you go. I think it will be a tremendous week, and it will. It will change your life. So pray about what God would have you to do. And even if you say, Pastor, I can't go, maybe you want to support one of our teens or one of our adults that are going to go on the trip with us. So we'll give you opportunities to support somebody on our Mexico missions trip. So Mexico matters. We're excited about this opportunity. We're going to ask our boys and girls that are here to come on up front.
Well, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Did you guys like the snow? You played in it? The entire afternoon. Wow. So today in my message to the adults, I'm going to be talking about wisdom. Wisdom. So up on the screen, if we can go to the next slide, wisdom is doing things God's way. Yeah, it can be very, very smart. But I, that's knowledge. I'm going to use that for knowledge when we talk about knowledge. But wisdom is doing things God's way, and foolishness is doing things man's way. Doing things Adam's way. So I thought what we would do today was we would demonstrate. So I'm going to get Pastor Keith to come on up. He doesn't know this. Come on up, Pastor Keith. So he's going to help me. And what, what you guys are going to do is you're going to say whether that's wisdom or foolishness. Okay? So, so I, I brought some toys here for us to play with, okay? So we're going to, him and I are going to play with the, this, okay? You want to play with this? Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't like the way you're playing. I'm not going to play with you anymore. Now, is that wisdom or is that foolishness? Why is it foolishness? Right, right. So, so now Keith is going to be my son. Oops. He's going to be my son. Keith, you left your toys out. I want you to pick those up and put them away. Keith, Keith, I told you to put your toys away. Now, is that wisdom or is that foolishness? Why? Yeah, because he's playing with them instead of putting them away. Keith, I want you to sit down and I want you to study a verse from the Bible. Okay? I'll take your toys. You go ahead and study. Now, is that wisdom or foolishness? Wisdom. wisdom. Why? Because he's reading the Bible. Right. He's doing what I ask him to do. Okay? So, let's do one more here, Keith. So, Keith and I are at school. And we're, we're waiting to get on the swing set together. Okay? We're waiting in line. You know, I'm going to get my... <laughs> What's that? Hey. <laughs> Is that wisdom or foolishness? Foolish. Foolishness. Right. Right. Let's try one more. Oh, let's, let's get on the swing set. Let's get on the swing. Hey, you, you go first. You go ahead. What's that? Wisdom. wisdom. No, that's wisdom. So, in life, we make choices every day whether we're going to be wise or whether we're going to be fools. And so the Bible has a lot. In fact, there's a book in the Bible in the Old Testament that is all about wisdom and foolishness it's a whole book it's one of the wisdom books so let's see if maybe an adult out here can help us anybody know what that book is proverbs yeah proverbs as you read proverbs it's a book about either doing things god's way or doing things man's way so Wisdom and foolishness are what we're going to be talking about a little bit later with the adults, so I thought that would be good for us today. So you can come, get some cookies, and get some papers. Yes, you're right. Proverbs is...
stand to sing this next song with us. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you died I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside Once again I thank you Once again I pour out my life Now you are exalted to the seated. Let's pray for our offering this morning. Father, again, we come thanking you for this day that you've given us to come and to worship you. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have to give back to you this morning through our tithes and our offerings. Lord, I, I pray, Father, that these funds that come in today would be used to continue uh, to reach our area and this world with the gospel of Christ. Father, I certainly this morning continue to uphold Lucy and Ralph. And Father, we know you have the time already appointed for Lucy's death. Uh, Father, we pray especially for Ralph as... Every day he comes to hospice and sits for eight to nine hours a day at her bedside. And Lord, I, we know that it's been very difficult for him. And may you continue to give him the grace and strength that he needs each day, Father, as he goes through this difficult time. And again, Lord, we thank you that we know when that time comes that Lucy's going to be with you in heaven. And uh, so, Lord, we would ask that that time would come quickly, Father. Again, Father, thank you for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we're going to do communion, but we're going to sort of do it a little bit different rather than just tacking it on. I wanted to sort of make this the center of our service this morning. We're going to dismiss our kids to go up for junior church, all of our kids that are here. 
Now that want to go for junior church, you can go. I have a, as our kids are leaving, a statement that I want you to think about. Here's the statement. The Son of Man came. The Son of Man came. What does the rest of that statement say? The Son of Man came. What did the Son of Man come? To seek and to save the lost. There's three times in the Bible that this statement is used. The Son of Man came seeking and saving the lost. And then it says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Now those two are the ones that we know the most, right? But this third one that I'm going to share with you is one that we really don't think about at all. So, the Son of Man came Seeking the lost, the Son of Man came to, uh, or seek, to seek and to save the lost. The Son of Man came to be served, but not uh, to serve, but um, not to be served. And then the third one that we hardly ever think about is this one: the Son of Man came eating and drinking. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Interesting, isn't it, that that statement is made that Jesus came eating and drinking. Maybe someday we'll do a study in the book of Luke. Because if you read through the book of Luke and you outlined or you highlighted every time it talks about Jesus eating, you would be amazed. But the thing about this is this, that Jesus always had a purpose when he ate. Jesus not just to fill his body with nourishment, but Jesus' purpose in eating was so much more than just eating. And as you get into the book of Luke and you begin to study those different times that he ate, it's interesting. But uh, one of the times, of course, is what? The last supper that he spent in, his upper, in the upper room with his disciples. And uh, on that night, when he instituted the Lord's Supper, they had what? They had eaten a meal together, and in the middle of that meal is when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And so, I don't know that we ever think about this, but the Lord's Supper so then was built around a time of fellowship. And in the Bible, they would have sometimes what is called a love feast, where they would come and they would eat together, and then they would partake of the Lord's Supper together. So again, the Lord's Supper was built around what? Built around fellowship. And so this morning, as we go into communion, I wanted us to think about that a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to look at some scripture. Uh, I'm going to read, and then Bob is going to lead you in reading some scripture this morning also. So we're going to sort of go back. We're going to sing a couple songs uh, and again, they tie in to this thought of fellowship and how the Lord's Supper is built around fellowship. So if we can go to the next slide. I'm going to read this. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Uh, join me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. So again, it's about fellowship with God. And as we come to the communion table this morning, it's about fellowship with God. Go to the next one. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father has had and has appeared to us. Join me. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we're going to sing. I would ask you to stand. When I survey the wondrous cross.
So communion is about fellowship. It's about fellowship with God. But it's also about fellowship with one another. Just like on that evening, on that last supper, the disciples had fellowship with one another. And uh, so as we today partake of communion, it's a time that we have that opportunity to do it together as a body of Christ. So it's about us fellowshipping with one another at the communion table. The Word of God says, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Again, walking in light. We've been talking about walking in the light. And if we walk in the light, we naturally have fellowship one with another. So we'll sing a song that lends to that fellowshipping with one another. Blessed be the tie that binds. You can stay seated. Fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. 1 John 1, 5 through 7. Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. This is fellowship with God. Jesus said, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, as you are in me, and I am in you. This is fellowship with one another. And then I want us to say this prayer of confession. You know, one of the things about communion is that we prepare our hearts. 
It's an opportunity for us to confess anything that might stop us from coming to the Lord. So we're going to read this together, this prayer of confession. Holy God, hear our prayer for the mending of our hearts, torn apart by our unkindness, for the healing of our souls, wasting away from the despair around us, for the forgiveness we seek for the sin we have allowed to persist, for the reconciliation of the world whose division condemns us. We pray for the courage to admit our fault, the strength to amend our action, and the hope that we, your grace, awaits us. Through Christ we pray, amen. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads as we continue in this thought of communion fellowship. Communion is fellowshipping with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Communion is fellowshipping with one another around the Lord's table. And so this morning, before we partake of the elements, I would ask you, is there anyone, maybe you and God aren't in fellowship right now? And the way to, again, mend that fellowship is to confess. Is there any sin that you've not confessed? If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So in the quietness of this moment, may you confess any sin that the Holy Spirit brings to your mind so that you can be in fellowship with God. And then if there's anyone that you are not right with, because again, coming to the communion table is fellowshipping also with one another. So if, if there's someone that you're not right with, and I know you can't go make that right now, but I would encourage you, don't partake of communion this morning. The scripture says that when we come, that we need to come with clean hearts and clean hands. And so the Bible says that many are sick among you because they've partaken <clears throat> Of communion wrongly. They've taken communion when they still have aught against brothers and sisters in Christ. Communion, fellowship with God and fellowship with others. And so to come to the communion table, that fellowship needs to be right between God and others. I'm going to return thanks for the wafer that reminds us of Christ's body that was given for us. Father, we do thank you that you were willing to go to the cross and to die for us. Father, you were willing to give your body because you loved us so much. Lord, I pray as we now partake of this wafer that reminds us of your body, that, Lord, we would be thankful for what you've done for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. The scripture says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I'm going to return thanks for the juice that reminds us of his blood. Father, we thank you for your blood that was shed for the remission of sin. Father, we thank you that what's different in the New Testament is that your blood washes away our sin. In the Old Testament, the blood of the animals blotted out. But Lord, your blood washes away our sin as far as the east is from the west. It makes us whiter than snow, Father. And so thank you again for shedding your blood so that we 
could have forgiveness of sin, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Again, the word of God says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So this morning, remember, communion is about fellowship. Fellowship with God and fellowship with others. You can stay seated, but if you'd join me in singing this last song. Heart and lead me in your love. 
Thank you, praise team. Open your Bibles, if you have them, to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. And uh, we have just a few verses today. Thus, my message will be a little bit shorter. I want us to go back to verse 1 before we look at our verses for today and uh, remind you that it says, therefore be imitators of God. And we've been talking about this, that we're to imitate Christ. And we've talked about imitating Christ in two ways thus far. Can you tell me what they are? We are to walk in two things. Love and light. Thank you. We're to walk in love and light. So I'm not sure if we can go to our PowerPoint here where our message is. So we are to walk in love and light. And uh, we are to be imitators of Christ in those two areas. And today we're going to talk about walking in wisdom. Walking in wisdom, and we, we did that a little bit with our kids this morning. And, uh, but I want to share with you, if we could this morning, uh, before we talk about wisdom, I want to talk to you about the opposite of wisdom, which is foolishness. Foolishness. And again, I had it up there. Uh, wisdom is doing things God's way. Let's say that together. Wisdom is doing things God's way. And foolishness is doing things man's way. Let's say that. Foolishness is doing things man's way. Now, if we were to go to the book of Proverbs that I mentioned to the boys and girls, when we go through the book of Proverbs, we read it and we read the word simply as fool or foolishness. But there are two different words as you read. We just read it as fool or foolishness. But there are two different words in the original language because there are two different fools that are presented in Proverbs. One is a pig-headed fool, and the other is a bull-headed fool. And it's really interesting when you go through and you study the book of Proverbs, you almost have to know which, when it says about this fool, you have to know whether it's speaking, whether it's using the one, the one word or the other word because it gives a whole different meaning. So, and I left this down here, so I'm going to come get this, but I'll, I'll show it to you here. And I, I'm not going to go all through these, but in Proverbs 16, 22, it says, He despises wisdom. That's the bullheaded fool. The bullheaded fool in Proverbs 29, 9 doesn't listen to reason. The bullheaded fool in Proverbs 27, 22 will not change. The pig-headed fool's reaction, though, it says he also despises wisdom in Proverbs 1, 7 and verse 22. The pig-headed fool's reaction, he will not listen to instruction, Proverbs 23, 9. The pig-headed fool is a waste time in Proverbs 17, 16. And, and so we could go all through that, and you could see the difference. And sometime we will do a study through Proverbs, and I will show you the two different types of fools, the pig-headed versus the bull-headed fool. The uh, bull-headed fool in sin. Uh, the bull-headed fool, he mocks sin. He thinks sin is funny. He doesn't fear it, but instead he likes it. In fact, he enjoys the, when the righteous people are shocked by his sin. The pig-headed fool, he enjoys sin and views it as a sport or as a game in Proverbs 10.23. The pig-headed pig fool thinks it's sin not to sin in Proverbs 13.19. And the pig-headed fool never considers the consequences of sin in Proverbs 14, 8. And so, you know, when you think about those two types of fools, I've seen those. So you think of somebody who is pig-headed. And when we think of a pig, what do they do? They grunt, don't they? 
I mean, they're, they're not the one who screams and yells. They just sort of grunt. And, and that's the type of this fool. And then the bullheaded fool, he's the person that just charges after you and is right in your face all the time. And so, again, it's interesting when you look at the book of Proverbs and you see the two different types of fool, and everybody who is a fool falls into one of those two categories. And, uh, but our scripture this morning says that we should not be a fool. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as why, unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, he, he starts out by saying, look carefully. He gives you a warning here. He says, listen, I need you to watch out. I need you to look carefully how you walk. Because, listen, you need to watch because the days are evil. We had taken a vacation out to San Diego and uh, we had stayed at a resort outside of San Diego. In fact, for those who are older will know this, Larns Welk. Everybody used to watch the Larns Welk show. He had a resort there, and we stayed at the resort. And the funny thing about that resort, it was in the side of a mountain. They're beautiful, beautiful, about 30 miles north of San Diego. But all around the resort were these signs that said, Watch where you walk, rattlesnakes active. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that, seeing those signs. And it's, for me, I hate snakes, any kind of snake. And so, man, when, when we went outside, no matter where we went, I was always looking around because I didn't want to step on a rattlesnake. But those signs, those warnings are sort of what Paul is saying. Watch out. Listen, the days are evil. And you need to walk in wisdom in these evil days because if you're not careful, you'll end up being what? You'll end up doing evil things. So this is what he's saying to us here. Watch out. Be careful. And so there are three things that you need to do to walk in wisdom. It's three simple points this morning that you need to do to walk in wisdom. In verse 17, he says, therefore, do not be foolish. He says, don't be foolish. Look carefully how you walk, not as wise, but unwise. So the first thing you need to do to walk in wisdom is simply this. You need to fear God. You need to fear God because Proverbs 1, 7 says this. Wisdom begins with the fear of God. Wisdom begins with the fear of God. What does it mean to fear God? Consider what it says in Psalms 147. He delight, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those whose hope is steadfast. I have a, a, a friend who described his grandfather as a cantankerous old man who would sit around the house and when him and his cousins would come to visit their grandfather and they were running, he would take his cane and hit him across the back of the legs. And he said he was just a cantankerous old man sitting in the chair, you know, trying to keep people from having fun. So is that what God is like? Does he not want you to have fun? Does he not want you to enjoy life? See, God commands us to fear him. And, and certainly my friend said, we feared our grandfather because he would beat us with the cane. So is that the way God is? Should we fear God that, man, when I sin, God is standing there waiting to beat me over the head because I sinned? I don't think so. I don't think that's what it's talking about. I thought this is a humble so in, in this sense, to fear him means to stand in awe of who he is. It says in Psalms 33, 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. To, fa to fear the Lord is to stand in awe of his majesty, to stand in awe of his power, to stand in awe of his intelligence, to stand in all of his beauty, of who he is. And that's what it means to fear God. 
his, to stand in awe of his wisdom, his justice, his mercy, and even his judgment, his life, his death, his resurrection, that we are simply in awe and we adore him for what he's done. And that's really what the Bible talks about, is that we should stand in awe of who God is. And God delights when we do that. And so simply, if we're going to walk in wisdom, we need to have a healthy fear of God. And that healthy fear of God is simply standing in awe of who he is. The second thing, he says that we need to use our time wisely. So first of all, I need to stand in awe of God. I need to fear him. And secondly, he says in this portion of scripture, he says making the best of use of time because the days are evil. Napoleon, the great general, said this, There is, in the midst of every great battle, a 10- to 15-minute period that is the crucial point. Take that period, and you win the battle, lose it, and you will be defeated. Interesting that Napoleon looked at every battle, that every battle was lost in a 10 or 15 minute period in the midst of that battle. And so for us, again, he's saying, listen, I need to make the most of my time. We need to take full advantage of every opportunity that we have to live for God. Um, we are his children and God has allowed us and he's given each of us a certain amount of time. You're not guaranteed how long you're going to live. In fact, the Bible says you have an appointment with death. We don't know when that appointment is. We don't know when it's coming. For everyone, it's different. But the time that we have, we need to use it wisely. The, greatest, the great 16th century reformer, Philip Malchon, kept a record of every wasted moment and took his list to God in confession at the end of each day. Every minute he wasted, he wrote it down, and at the end of the day, he felt he should confess that to God. I believe that we spend a lot of wasted time. How do we do it? I, I read an article in Forbes magazine this week that says, We waste time by being disorganized, by procrastinating, by scrolling through social media, media by worrying. And then it went on to give you a pretty interesting uh, breakdown of how we use our time. 2.34 hours checking emails. And then 30% of those are neither urgent or important, it said. 35 minutes deciding what to eat. 16 minutes deciding what to wear. That's for women. It's 14 minutes for men. <laughs> Seven minutes thinking about exercise, but doing nothing. Four hours watching TV, 96 minutes surfing non-work related websites, 171 minutes checking your smartphone, 90 minutes in daily interruptions, uh, 37 minutes on Facebook, 27 minutes on other social media accounts, 40 minutes on YouTube, and one hour in meetings. And then he went on to say in that article, 50% of that time is wasted anyway in meetings. So we... <laughs> We use our time all kinds of ways, and we waste it all kinds of ways. Now, that's the average person. You might not say, I don't spend four hours watching TV every day. I spend eight. But whatever. <laughs> we do tend to waste time, and I would have to raise my hand and say, I can get caught up in that also. I find myself sometimes sitting in the office surfing on my phone. And, and so we waste a lot of time. But why? Why? Listen, here's the reason we shouldn't be, because the days are evil. And certainly the days that we live in are evil. And so we need to be walking in love and light so we can be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. I think I said this a few weeks ago, and I'm still amazed as we finished up on Wednesday, the book of Revelation. And in chapter 22 of the book of Revelation, one last time... One last time, God calls the sinner the center to repentance. I mean, we're at the end of time, and God's saying, listen, when you read this book, you need to heed to it. You need to obey it. You need to do what it says. You need to repent. And one last time. 
And so that, that reminded me of fresh and anew again this week that I need to be using my time wisely to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And I waste time. I waste opportunities sometimes. And he said, listen, this is what you need to do. You need to redeem your time because the days are evil. So if I'm going to walk in wisdom, I need to fear God, and then I need to redeem my time. And then there's one last thing he says that if I'm going to walk in wisdom, he says this. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The third thing he says in this short portion of Scripture is not only do I need to fear God, not only do I need to use my time uh, wisely, but I need to walk in the will of God. Now, there's a lot of debate and, you know, things like that about what is the will of God? Pastor, you know, sometimes finding the will of God is so hard. You know, should I go to this college? Should I marry this person? What should I take this job? What should I do? How do we find the will of God? And, and, and somebody wrote in a book, I can't even tell you who it is, or I'd give them credit, but they said, why would God make salvation so easy and finding his will so hard? Just as easy as salvation is, I think finding God's will is pretty easy also. And so let me give you several places in these last few minutes what God's will is for your life. First of all, God wants people saved. 1 Timothy 2.34, it says, and it's God's will, it's God's desire that all men would come to Christ. So these all have S's except the last one. So the first one is God wants people saved. He wants people saved. He wants people to come to the knowledge of Him. That's why it's important that we share the good news of Jesus Christ with as many people as we can because He desires. It's His will. The sad thing is not all men will choose that direction, but that's what God really desires. The second thing it says is He desires people to be spirit filled. Um, look at the, the very next thing it says, and do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery. He says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he, right after that, he says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Number two is God's desire is for you to be Spirit-filled. I'm not going to spend much time here because I'm not going to take Dave Lloyd's thunder away because Dave is preaching on this portion of Scripture next week. And he's going to be talking to you about what does it mean to be spirit-filled. At the moment of salvation, at the moment of salvation, you get the Holy Spirit living with inside of you. And I would agree with Jay Greider. I got to visit with May and Jay this week, and we were sitting around talking, and Jay is listening. And all of a sudden, he just pipes right in. And he said, you know what, Pastor, let me tell you something. I said, okay, go ahead, Jay. And he said... I don't think we spend enough time talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit is a person that lives within us. Now listen, Jay might have some problems thinking right now, but he was right on. He was right on when he said that. Because I don't think sometimes we think enough about the Holy Spirit. When you get up in the morning, listen, the Holy Spirit is right there with you. When you drive in your car in the morning, the Holy Spirit is there with you. When you're at work all day, the Holy Spirit is there with you. He lives with inside of you. He is a person living within you. And we need to realize that we need to be controlled, and that's what it's saying. So God desires for us to be spirit-controlled. That's His will. And so we ought to be talking to the Holy Spirit a lot more than we do. Number three, God's desire for you is to be sanctified. Sanctified from sin. He tells us that in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I ought to be set apart. I ought to do everything I can to avoid sin. And then, next, it's God's will for you to be submissive. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, he tells us it's his will for us to submit to those who are over us. That means to our government. Whether the Democrats or the Republicans are in power, we need to submit. That's what he's saying. Listen, it says, we're going to see this in two weeks. 
Wives, submit to your husbands. And all the men are saying, yeah, yeah, I can't wait till that message. Two weeks, guys, come back. <laughs> but the verse before that, that Dave's going to talk about next week, it says, submit one to another. Mm. It's a contradictory. Wives, can you tell your husbands, hey, you have to submit to me too. That's what it says in Scripture. It's what Dave's going to tell you. <laughs> Won't be my fault. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's true. We need to be submissive. We need to submit to those in authority over us. Whether it's our boss, whether it's the government, we need to submit. That's the will of God, it says. Here's another one, and this one is really tough. 1 Peter 4.19, it says, It's God's will for us to suffer. It's God's will for us to suffer. Do you know why I think that we don't have real committed Christians in America? Because we don't suffer. No, yeah, we, we do suffer some. I'm going to say, you know, we lose people that we love. That's suffering. I understand that. You know, we, we go through some physical things. That's suffering. I understand that. But we've never had to suffer for our faith. When you read through Scripture, you'll find that everybody is what? Suffering for their faith. You open up in the book of James, the New Testament book of wisdom, and it says they were what? They were scattered, and they were going through what? Colorful trials. It's the word actually in the original language. Colorful trials. And that means many different types of trials and tribulations. He, it's God's will for us to suffer. You know, when Jesus Christ was here on earth, he suffered. People made fun of him. They, they, and, and, you know, they chased him out of towns. They threw rocks at him. And then when we look at his disciples, the same thing. Uh, they were all martyred for their faith. They suffered for Christ. And, and I don't think we understand Christ. And uh, I remember my dad spent two years fighting bone cancer and uh, such, a, such a painful ordeal. And I remember talking to dad one day, and uh, he was talking about the suffering, and he said this. He said, you know, my suffering has allowed me to share the gospel with so many nurses. It's allowed me to share the gospel with my Jewish doctor, my oncologist. He said, you know what? If I didn't have this bone cancer, I never would have had these contacts. But he said, it's through suffering I've been able to share the gospel. It says in 1 Peter 4.12, Since Christ suffered in the flesh, be ready. Arm yourself with the same purpose. Arm yourself with the same purpose to suffer in the flesh. It's the will. It says it's God's will for us to suffer. So the next time you go through something difficult, the next time you go through something, say, okay, God, I'm in the middle of your will right now. Whoa, that's a different way to look at it, isn't it? And then the last one is not an S. Saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive to suffer. You read it. It's all God's will for those things. And then the last one, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, it is God's will for us to be thankful. You want to know what God's will is for your life? It's God's will for you to be saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, to suffer, and to be thankful for everything. That's his will. So that's his revealed will. He's revealed those things in Scripture to us. So listen, here's the way I always look at it. If I'm saved, if I'm walking in the Spirit, if I'm, I'm trying to be sanctified, if I'm trying to avoid sin, if I'm being a submissive to all those who are over me, if I'm even going through some suffering, and I'm being thankful for all those things, that's His revealed will. If I'm doing all those things, the other stuff is going to come easy. But sometimes the reason we struggle so much in finding God's 
will is because we're not doing his revealed will. Do his revealed will first, then those other things about who I should marry, where I should I go to school, should I buy this car, should I buy this house, you know, what should I do? When you are doing those things, the other things are what? They're going to be easy. Sometimes the reason we struggle with finding God's will is because we're not willing to do his revealed will that he's already given to us. So, how do we walk in wisdom? Three simple things. We fear God, we use our time wisely, and we understand and do the will of God. That's how you walk in wisdom. Walk in love, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. Next week, Dave will, Dave's message is so important next week. Because what Dave is going to share with you, what he's going to share with you next week, controls the rest of the book. He, he has a, only several verses, but I want to tell you, as you come next week and you listen to his message, what he's going to share with you will determine whether you're going to be a good husband. It's going to determine whether you're going to be a good wife. It's going to determine whether you're going to be a good parent. It's going to determine whether you're going to be a good child or teenager. It's going to determine whether you're a good employee or employer. That's how important his verses are next week. Because everything else in the rest of the book of Ephesians is built around his message next week. It's a lot of pressure on him, isn't it? <laughs> But it is, so don't miss next week's message. It's important to the rest of the book of Ephesians. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity we've had to be here today. Lord, we've had to learn about our missions trip, which we're excited about. We've had to partake of communion and think of how communion is not only fellowship with God, but it's fellowship with each other. And so you've told us, Lord, in the word that to take communion, we need to be right with you and we need to be right with our brothers and sisters. We need to be in fellowship with you and each other. And then, Lord, we've gotten to look at how to walk in wisdom. Simple. We need to fear God. We need to use our time wisely. And then we need to know and do what the will of God is. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand, turn to the person next to you, and say, you are really nice looking. You're dismissed. <laughs>